Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome this morning to how to use lean value stream mapping to improve any IT process. Uh, this is a Breakfast with Tink session this morning, and I'm your host and uh, presenter this morning, Troy Dumoulin. I'm the Vice President with Think Elephant, uh, and I work in the area of product management, research, and innovation. I've actually been with the company now for 18 years, so I've seen many different frameworks and talk about often the opportunities for integration of different models. And that's what we're going to be discussing today. In essence, how to use lean value stream mapping, lean in general, uh, we'll, but we will speak about value stream mapping specifically as well as one of many lean tools to improve any IT process, any process at all, uh, if you want to take it literally. And uh, just a few parts of housekeeping here this morning. I trust all of you have uh, logged in and have your audio going, and uh, I hope you have your recreational breakfast beverage of choice, coffee or tea or whatever that might be. And the session will be recorded for those who can make it today, and each of you who do attend today will receive a link to that recording. So that will be available to you after the fact. I welcome questions that uh, you might have as I'm going through this session. You can use the question and answer aspect. I'll look at the questions after we finish the session and we can discuss and I can respond to any concerns or or ideas that you might have about how to better use Lean. So in general, our session today will follow this flow. And Lean is all about flow, and we're going to learn a lot about flow today and throughput. And now we're going to talk about why do we need Lean? What's the business case? What's the problem statement? And uh, what does Lean allow us to do in the context of process improvement or continual improvement methodology? In fact, uh, I like personally to look at Lean as a practical continual service improvement or CSI methodology. A lot of best practices talk about uh, continual improvement, offer suggestions of how that might be done, but in my experience, Lean is probably the most practical when it comes to providing methods and concrete thinking models and tools for actually how to improve process. Now, part of that flow analysis and flow improvement, throughput improvement, is to look at the concepts of lean waste analysis. There are many things that we do today that frankly shouldn't be done or many things that we're doing today that we should do less of. And there are things that we do today we should focus more on. And this is where we're going to get to lean waste analysis. And then that value stream will come into play where we now look at elements of time throughput. And there are many different time elements we're going to look at in a value stream. So this is the goal of our today's session. Uh, roughly is scheduled for 60 minutes. I plan to be about 45 minutes in content, and then we'll have a Q&A time at the end of our session today. So let's start with the problem statement. So IT is an industry. Uh, we are, you know, of course, later in the adoption of lean principles. Lean's been around for decades, and many could argue since the turn of the 1800s with the birth of the industrial uh, evolution, revolution in the concept of the manufacturing space. But over these periods of decades, we've seen adoption of lean principles across many different verticals. And we've seen a move from manufacturing into healthcare, into services industry, into higher education. And now recently, there's a lot of conversation about how can we use lean in the context of IT management value streams and indoor processes. Well, let's think about it this way. Uh, any organization in its early infancy, its early design, begins its optimization and evolution around task specialization. So we look at a value chain, and I'll talk about the, you know, the, at the highest level, we have a value chain of demand, plan, build, run. So there's someone in your organization today that has a conversation with a business consumer or service consumer around demand, um, the kind of requirements they would have for net new value or enhanced value creation. That demand conversation, requirements generation discussion turns itself into kind of blueprint design, architecture concepts, which are validated, yes, back against the voice of customer requirements. Uh, then at that point, we stand up a project or hand the task over to a development team to build. And then, of course, we test and validate that build against requirements. We move that to production, and then we get the, skill, you know, the honor of support. So pretty much everyone on this call today is somewhere in this macro value chain. I want you to think about that value chain in your organizational structure, and it's not just the internal organizational structure, but you're going to have multiple third parties uh, that are involved in that value chain, 
and it depends on the complexity. You can call it a value stream, a value chain, a value network. But the premise is I have value flowing across what we often think as vertical organizational structures and or silos. And typically, we will structure optimizations, improvements vertically. We'll try to optimize requirements generation. We'll try to optimize the project management methods we're using. We'll optimize the run or operation side. And that you know, does something relative to the task of specialization. But the issue here is that value flows horizontally across all of those structures. And this is where we get into challenges, because if we focus on vertical optimization by silo, often what will happen is we'll have multiple ways of accomplishing many goals. Uh, we'll have multiple tools for you know, inventory management, asset management, multiple processes for approving changes to various elements of my environment, uh, multiple ways for ensuring risk uh, or security, multiple ways of managing projects. And so it's not that we lack process. It's not that we lack value stream. The more value providers we have in this value stream, the more stakeholders involved in this complex network and system, the more fragmentation. Now, it's all about flow. Remember, speed to value. And a lot of the conversation today around agile is rapid release, rapid development cycles, flow to value quickly. And that's a big part of lean, and lean is a big part of agile. The premise, though, is that when you have multiple ways of doing anything, you're going to inherently have a variability that's going to have a cost and effect, a causality. It's going to cause you um, redundancy, which is going to cause you cost, which is going to cause you additional complexity. Additional complexity gives you more potential for defect. That defect gives you the opportunity for more rework. That rework gives you the ability to slow down. And re the reality is the speed of throughput through a organization that's focused vertically is limited and constrained by the bottlenecks. And this is where we can get into a discussion of theory of constraints and the fact that our flow is constrained by the, the limiting factor of capacity in our environment. But I'll leave that for another conversation. But let's for the moment consider we've been doing the work of IT for decades, as all organizations have had their value streams for decades, if not hundreds of years. The reality is, imagine this dotted line. This is the speed of capability, the speed of value generation that we can currently handle with the current complexity, redundancy, <laughs> variability in our, in our model where we focus on vertical. However, the demand speed continues to increase exponentially. And this is, you know, at the rate of change today, the built-on web economy, it's not a matter of waiting six months. We have to be able to be agile enough to uh, release new feature business value within a matter of days, if not weeks. The reality is the speed of demand continues to increase, but our ability to produce value is limited by our current capabilities and the redundancy and the variability. So we have to do something about standardization. In fact, before you ever talk about best practice or good practice, the goal, first of all, should be standard practice because you can't stabilize or improve things which are not standardized. So this is a key aspect. Now this limitation, based on the complexity and variability of our environment, as you can see by this green star, places the business at risk because it trusts the IT organization to be able to deliver the value it needs relative to whether it's an existing service or a project that's being brought on. But if we can't do that in a time needed, and we can't do that with a quality needed, now we place the business at risk and they look at the supplier and say, okay, you're not providing the value I need on time. And this is a big part of the lean conversation we're going to have on the next slide where we talk about the, the question of what provides, what provides value and time is a major component of that. So this slide kind of gives you a sense of this is where we are today. We get the job done, but what took us this far can't take us further so something has to change. What needs to change is a focus on value stream optimization, flow optimization, rapid value generation. That won't be done by the status quo of focusing on silo-based, task-based specialization. Now, one last thing I'll add to this slide. This is a, there's a trend in our industry, and we talked about this at the think tank uh, last year at the event in February at Pink Elephant Conference. 
to externalize more and more of our value stream to third-party suppliers. Whether you're introducing cloud options or managed service providers, the trend is because the value of that third party uh, provides and potential cost savings, you know, to introduce more players in my team, more players in my orchestra. So imagine what happens to complexity. That's going to grow. Now, the additional complexity without standardization increases the fragmentation and the non standardization, which is decreasing the speed. So without standard value streams defined, how do you integrate suppliers effectively and not impact detrimentally your value proposition relative to speed and flow and throughput? This is where lean is incredibly important today as we look at flow considerations. So let's take a look at some lean thinking. These are models that are introduced by the, uh, the framework, and it's all about starting, first of all, from an outside-in perspective. What does the customer want? What's the voice of customer requirement here? It's not about push, where IT says, this is what I think you need. It's about, first and foremost, understanding what are the requirements, which of those requirements are actually requirements, which will wish, and understanding that value is delivered by three primary attributes. Now, to give you the, a sense of the story, I, when I teach lean, I, I talk about um, planning a birthday party for my, my children. I, my sons are now older, but they, you know, at one point in my family life, they wanted mom and dad to create a party. Now, this is a metaphor and analogy, but it also applies to our world. So let's say my son comes to me and says, Dad, you know what? At my next birthday party, I'm going to want, I want a, I want a pony. I would like a pony, and I would like you know, pony rides. And so, okay, Dad gets on the ball. He starts sourcing potential pony suppliers. And, you know, first of all, I should have probably asked my son what kind of pony you're looking for. But the reality is I want to make sure that the pony has certain attributes, features that are available that, I, that are going to be um, satisfactory. So if I go and I find a pony that's going to be unruly, surly, and it bites the first kid that gets on his back, this is not going to be a good thing. So the quality aspect comes in the aspect of what are the features uh, and the non-functional requirements we need to think about relative to this plan. But that's not enough, because I could deliver the greatest pony in the world, but let's say that pony arrives a day after the birthday party. So the just-in-time delivery is critical to the value, because you're day late here, guy. The pony should have been here yesterday, right? The project's not on time. The development is not finished on time. So the fact that delivery and the, the cadence of delivery is key here. Now, let's say that pony comes to the party. It's actually on time. It arrives at a timely manner. But the guy won't unload the pony until I write him another check for 200 bucks. I'm not having a happy pony party at this point, right? So it, to hit value, you have to do three things. Deliver what they expect. It's benefit realization. Deliver it on on time, that's the basis of understanding your deadlines and hitting them. So speed and throughput and flow is critical here. And to understand the cost. Now the cost is all about the activity to get it there. And if I'm doing things that I shouldn't be doing or too much stuff that I shouldn't be doing, and it's not necessarily just waste, it could be too much administrative and or governance type of roles, I'm burdening this with costs that shouldn't be there. So the lean model of thinking as you have to think about three perspectives here. And we're going to talk today about the time aspect and the cost relative to, to waste analysis. There's other things that Lean talks about, and that is the reality is that the people closest to the work are the ones that probably have the best, no, not probably, they do have the best understanding of what opportunities there are for improvement. And this is the spirit of Jadoka, where if in the Toyota production system, we saw an opportunity where there's an error or defect. The employee is empowered to stop the line, to stop the manufacturing process and say, okay, let's fix this first and let's fix it early and let's make sure it doesn't happen again. So rather than living with those incidents we see happen over and over and over again without ever asking the, our questions why, rather than continue to see this new employee onboarding form missing a key field and never asking you know, what can we do about it, but having to kick that employee form back to the beginning of the process, causing rework and issues with flow. We see something, we stop, we fix it. That's called Jadoka. 
The premise of Ijanka on the bottom left corner is about demand and production leveling. I need to understand the incoming de demand to know what skills and resources I will need in production to handle that demand. So the premise of demand supply modeling is key here to lean. Kaizen, the improvement of incremental steps over time to make a great deal of improvement, five S's, you know, that's into the whole sort and stabilize and sustain. These are thinking models and they are applied to any process, whether we're talking about an IT service management process, an architectural process, a server build process, a new employee onboarding process. Every process has the opportunity to be evaluated from a waste flow and throughput perspective. Because the goal here is to preserve the value with the least amount of effort or work because the goal is not to reduce headcount, but it's about repositioning, reprioritizing, reinvesting work we need to do or resources we need to do in the context of time and people into more proactive and value-added activities. So let me tell you a story. The story will feel very similar to your own life. We want to think about this. Think about value streams in IT in the context of three overall macro value streams. And for every organization, these three value streams exist, whether they're defined or not, they exist. So the first value stream that an organization will typically pay attention to is the one in the middle, the yellow one, the application, project management, the net new build. Because let's face it, that's where net new value is created, that's where the customer focus often is, and we get a high degree of focus on improving project management methodology, whether we're using classic waterfall or agile rapid development method. It's all about how do I bring net new value. The reality is that most organizations stand that values came up first and the other ones don't exist in a formalized governed way for a moment. So let's imagine that there's just the one in the middle that's, that's managed and governed. So I get really good at becoming, quote unquote, the project factory. And many organizations are proud to call themselves this concept of a project factory. And I, and I become very you know, good at managing projects in their own right. So what typically happens in this case is that the projects go through a portfolio planning process, prioritize, resources are allocated to them. And each of these projects is stood up as its own self-contained entity it seconds or brings onto itself all the resources and skills it needs. And each project then begins to chug down the track on its own track, by the way. And then I stand up another track, another project and another track. And I've got all these projects and they're all heading down towards a common switching station. Or to change up my analogy, these planes are coming in and the, all the planes are heading towards a common runway and that's production. Now, the reality is they're going to ask along the way some non-functional conversations about, okay, what supplier requirements do I need? What about security and cyber considerations? What about service level management? So these are non-functional requirements we'll come back to in a second. But the reality is without a common definition of those orchestration processes, each project may get and probably will get different answers. So envision these, all these trains, all these planes are heading towards that common environment. And they're all going to land on the weekend, right? This is where it typically all happens because this is where projects come in. They're all landing on the weekend. Now, ask yourself, what is the worst day to be on the service desk? Now, immediately you're probably going to think, well, that's obvious. It's going to be uh, Monday, silly. Because what happens on Monday? The phone rings. Because the question I'm going to ask here for you to think about is how did those unorchestrated projects land. All these trains, planes are coming in all at the same time. Each of them has their own control tower. There is no common control tower. Each of them is landing in and on the front of this train to strap the project manager. So, you know, on time, on budget, hell or high water, it's going in, buddy. So they come in and they land hard. They may collide. They may simply not have been properly vetted and tested and production assured. The reality is they land hard. Now, that call on Monday comes in, the multiple calls come in. I want you to think about four types of work that will consider value. And these are planned. These are the things you planned to do when you came in on Monday. You could have planned to work on one of these net new customer value projects, okay? That's, that's value. Uh, you might have had a foundational project, one of those projects required to basically 
in, develop an environment that would sustain a net new customer initiative, upgrading your storage area network, for example. You probably had envisioned working on changes because, because changes by nature are going to be positive. They're going to do enhancements uh, or they're going to in, you know, make improvements. Changes are typically for the good. And then the fourth one is run. Some people simply you know, watch monitors and as Homer Simpson in the uh, nuclear facility has to watch uh, the SCADA systems as they, as they run. These are four areas of work that your customer expects you to do. In fact, you can look at the definition of waste in a very simple way. What would the customer willingly pay for if they had a choice? Now, the problem with the Monday morning scenario is that you plan to come in and do one of those four, but you didn't get a chance because the phone began to ring off the hook and you get called into the bottom value stream, support. And so you spend most of Monday uh, in unplanned support. Uh, you're lucky if you get cleared off on Monday. Most of us probably are not looking to get out of unplanned work before the end of Tuesday. Now we've got Wednesday where you're catching up from the fact that you actually not had a chance to work on the stuff you planned to do on Monday and all the emails you've been coming, have been coming in you haven't got to. So if you're lucky, Thursday, you eventually get to an opportunity you can actually get to planned work. It's not a wonder that the business is saying that IT is slow. Now, I'm not decrying support, but when I ask the average organization, average person, how much time do you typically spend in support, I want you to think about that in your own average daily of life. They typically will give me anywhere from 65 to 75% of their life is spent in unplanned work. Now, I want to hold that thought for you for a moment because I want to then come back to another conversation. Now, ideally, we have these processes on top, and these are the orchestration processes that we have all these things in motion, all these projects going on. We've hired the best possible talent for the string section, for the, uh, the percussion section, for the wind section. But without the orchestration, the common score, the common music, and the cadence required through conducting, we don't know how to orchestrate or to have each of these parts play in their proper cadence in the right time in the right moment. So we have not harmony, cacophony. So we have to be able to deal with ensuring that we have non-functional requirements and orchestrating all these projects because on the top line where service management comes into strategy and design and transition, this is where the non-functional requirements, as you can see, are fed into the build stream so that we continue to flow this stuff so that it doesn't land on Monday morning with all this challenge. Production assurance activities, evaluation on business requirements, ensuring that non-functional considerations around cybersecurity and or, or vendor management considerations, all of these things have to be baked in as well. Otherwise, we get Monday morning, we get this unplanned work issue. Now, the last thing I'll say about this slide is that this individual down here on the bottom left, this is you. Now, ideally, we have learned, as you can see, feedback loops coming through, ideally, but that's not my experience. But this person is you, and you get the opportunity to be in all three value streams in your life. The problem with that is that studies show that parallel tasking Multitasking is impossible for the human being, regardless of gender, apparently, even though my wife says differently. The reality is all we can do is time slicing, you know, move from task to task to task. The more tasks that you move to, though, you're going to have a cost to pay in switching costs. The time it takes you to remember where you were last time you picked up this task and the time it takes you to basically close a task to move on to the next, which is like filing, you know, for example, or putting your code in the definitive repository. So the average uh, person will lose another 10 to 15% minimal on switching costs. Now remember back to that 65, 75% costs, you know, in the reality of unplanned work, add another 10 to 15% and it gets worse the more tasks you switch to. Okay, now I'm gonna ask you here, is there an opportunity to improve flow by value stream analysis? I think you're feeling the pain. Now, one more thing before I leave this slide is that a lot of organizations that implement service management do so from the right to the left. They get the incident, the problem, the change process going. 
and they get better at service restoration and managing the gating of things into production. But if you never move beyond change management, I want you to ask yourself something. What do you do, really, to deal with the sources of unplanned work on Monday morning? Think about that for a minute. If you never get into demand, planned, and build, or design, or strategy, design, and transition practices, all you do is really get better at getting out of the way faster. This is the average organization that has adopted service management. They've never moved back into the value stream to deal with sources of unplanned work. They're never getting off the hamster wheel of death. So there's a premise here I want you to think about. We have to start thinking of value streams, not just specific actions, not even specific processes, because specific processes are still going to give me a silo view to the overall value stream. So let's talk about a process for a moment in the premise of value stream analysis. So any process, it doesn't matter, again, if it's getting my kids out of bed and at school in their desk or getting the dirty dishes out of the sink in the dishwasher back onto my uh, my count onto my cupboard or getting a change approved, an incident or service restored or a development project completed. All processes have raw inputs. These are the requirements. They have a set of activities for transforming something to an outcome, an output, a goal. And the speed of that, the throughput of that, will be limited based on the speed of each activity because that process will not flow, will not improve throughput any faster than the limiting bottleneck. But to even discover what your bottleneck is, you would have to look at it from an end-to-end -end perspective. You cannot discover bottlenecks by looking at it from a task specialization, task specialization perspective. So there's an analysis on the flow of value, the flow of work across the process itself. Above this, you see what we'll call controls. These are things that we do to ensure that the process not only uh, works well, but continues to improve. And next time I come looking, if I hope to find it there, it needs to have an owner. It needs to have someone considering the measurements. It needs to have documentation around standard ways of doing things. These are controls. They're necessary <laughs> evils. <laughs> I want to say that. But in, as you'll see in Lean, they're necessary. But they're not exactly value-add. Because value-add, again, from a Lean perspective, is what are the activities in the bottom that directly contribute to the goal. It's important to have controls, but too many controls will actually impede the cost and impede the perhaps the throughput aspect, and now we're over bureaucratic. So we have to look at work in all processes relative to three basic premises. There's this value-added work. The thing that I'm doing right now achieves a goal, um, a project being completed, a server being built. We have the necessary non-value. We have, you know, we have recruiting staff. We have finance and accounting. Testing is, is important, uh, but the right amount of testing, not overkill because too much testing. Now we're into too much uh, not necessary, non-value add. But then there are simply things that we just have to stop doing. Reports that we generate today that no one reads being willing and you know to solve the same issues over and over and over again the fact that we have multiple redundancy of processes tools around the environment we have to look at every single step in the process to say okay can i classify these typical 45 minutes i spend on this task based on the three types of work so i'm going to come back to this where we're going to see how do we shave off step by step by eliminating non value it's not worth doing minimizing the administrative controls and optimizing the value. So if we do that task by task, we're going to reduce costs and improve flow and be able to invest resources somewhere else. We'll come back to that again as an example. So as we move through this model, this is the lean principles. Then the principle one is, what is a principle? Think about a principle as something we must all collectively believe to share a goal. Okay. So we must all collectively agree that it begins and ends with customer value. Who defines customer value? Obviously, the voice of customer, not our best estimation, not what we believe is right, is what does the customer actually want. 
Once we understand that, we can start now looking at ways to improve. That's why we go to the top. We can't improve the value stream flow until I now assemble the process end to end and look for constraints in waste, look for capacity constraints, too much work flowing through this part of the activity stream. Literally, there's piling up of inventory in front of that activity, and they're not going to get to my task until like three weeks from now. So I've got a constraint in capacity, and I won't see where I'm actually spending too much time in waiting or too much time in non-value-added work until I map this thing end to end. I have to look at it from a value stream perspective. Because once I visualize it now as a value stream, I can now improve flow. Improving flow happens in two primary ways. First of all, you're going to improve flow by minimizing time spent in all activities. We'll come back to that when we look at a value stream map. So how do I look at time and how do I shave time to decrease time for, to total flow? Another way we improve flow is we look for points of defect. So if my problem management process says, hey, at this point in the process, this part, this form is always rejected and thrown back to the front of the process, okay, we've got a defect that is causing us rework, which is causing us issues of flow. So while we're looking at this, we're looking at time, we're looking at defect analysis, and if we can improve waste optimization, we can also only work on the things necessary or just do enough necessary non-value, not too much. All of those three elements will improve throughput to value, increase rapid value creation. Another key premise of Lean is the pull premise. The idea is we're working on the projects the customer prioritizes. We're not guessing or you know, deciding for the customer what we're doing. We're building in a pull model where we're working on the value stream activities that only make sense for the supplier. We're looking at a prioritization model because let's say I have an individual working in a functional department and they have multiple things they do every day. They have functional tasks to their department manager, they have project tasks, and they work in all these ITSM cross-functional processes. You know, they're working in disaster recovery, they're working in supplier, they're working in support, they're working in change. The reality is, I have to pull into my hands the things which are the highest priority. I have to get into a pull system of making sure I work on the right things at the right time based on some matrix of understanding of what is the model I'm going to work on. It's not just first in, first out. There might be different perspectives here. And then finally, if we believe all of the things that I'm trying to describe to you, we never stop asking why. We never stop challenging, can I do it faster? Can I continue to shave um, out things I shouldn't be doing? Can I continue to improve the premise of quality, delivery, and cost? Three elements of value. We think about waste. I want you to think about it in the three terms. These are some Japanese terms for you. Muda is the stuff we really shouldn't be doing. That's that incident we keep resolving over and over again and no one asks why. That's that report we generate that no one reads. But then there's this variation. Should we really have five ticketing tools? Really? Is that a business case or is that a political issue? Should we really have six ways of approving changes by application, by system? What about overburden? Now here's an interesting thing about Lean. Lean never talks about maximizing resources, in this case people. Because the more you pile on, the more this resource becomes overburdened. And I don't know about you, but when my workload becomes overburdened, I don't speed up, I slow down. My eyes get glazed over, I, I start to think, okay, what the heck am I gonna do today? And I really have a struggle because now I'm now breaking down on having an emotional and or you know, work crisis here. If you have too much in process or too much task that you're switching, you're going to decrease flow by overburden. This is where Lean talks about work in progress limits. Every resource, every capacity, every activity has a whip limit. We have to discuss what that is because we have to find the optimum balance. And if we overburden that activity, that resource, we will again have issues of flow. So when we think about these waste activities and we think about the three big M's, there's lots of things we can discuss when we do a waste analysis when we get to our value stream map. 
there's issues of just stuff just waits in queue or I'm, you know, I'm creating more than I need. So there's stuff in inventory that is just sitting on the shelf and I have costs tied up in that inventory. The variability I've already talked about in reality of, uh, of redundancy or just inflexibility. We have this, you know, fixed idea that we can only release new things to production once a quarter. Okay, who does that serve? IT or the consumer? So this concept of inflexibility and overburden, there's target-rich environment for us to do a waste analysis. So let's finally get to the concept of value stream mapping. Okay, so the first thing we need to do is to get a sense of what are we going to work on. Now, what are we going to work on? We're in this target-rich environment. I probably, probably thought of a hundred different things as I'm talking about what could be potentially improved, but not all things are equal in the eyes of the customer from the point of view of pain um, or, or issues of priority. So we need to get a sense of what are the, the biggest things that are eating our customers' lunch every day. When we get that sense, we're going to move into what we're going to talk about in the next slide is a SIPOC diagram. And we're going to look at this as a tool to quickly gain a consensus or better word, agreement on where the biggest pain point is. And this is going to allow us to get to a kind of a narrowing or prioritization on what will we target with a very focused incremental Kaizen activity. Because it's not about massive change in this case. Where do we make the most improvement um, that will have the biggest impact? Then we're going to look at step three, the process flow. So if you think about it, here's a typical thing you'll do in a process design. You'll think about the goal. You may ask the customer in this conversation. You're then going to say, okay, how do we target? Now, in my career, before I became a bit, you know, involved in the lean conversation, we would start with the process flow. We'd design it in Visio or some, you know, some process modeling tool, but we would stop there. Once we knew what the activities were, what the flow of activities were, what the questions were, where the branching was, and we know who did what, whether that was using a racy or a swim lane, we pretty much stopped right there. And we said, okay, let's implement this. A value stream is another step beyond process modeling. It's where we look and analyze either the current process or the future state process in terms of the three things we've discussed so far. The potential for waste, the potential for defect, and the potential for time. And this is where we're gonna do an analysis on more than just, this is a good process because the book said so, this is a good process because it's fit for purpose. So a value stream analysis is not process design. It's a further step beyond process design, which makes us think about not just what are we doing, but are we doing it to the right level? And here's where we're going to get into conversations around cadence and tack time. So let's talk about the SIPOC. The SIPOC is just an acronym. It's, a, it's kind of an exercise where you sit down and say, okay, what's the process we're dealing with here? Uh, it could be a requirements generation process. It could be a change management process. And everyone right now has a different opinion about where the process is broken. Uh, you could say the whole thing is broken. That's not helpful. Where can I target? So what we're going to do is we're going to talk about this process in terms of a big overall kind of view of it. So let's say it's a requirements generation process. Okay, who are the type of suppliers into this? It's not about vendors in this case. Who are the people that are inputting into requirements generation? Obviously, customers are. Uh, we could have you know, legal requirements coming in from audit. Uh, we could have you know, IT aspects to this. So there are many different suppliers, okay, to get through that step. What kind of things do they submit into this process? Well, project requests, uh, business as usual enhancements. Uh, we have legal requirements for compliance. Okay, let's talk about the type of attributes and you know, aspects of each of those. Now, from that macro requirements process, there's multiple steps. There's you know, having a conversation with the customer. There is getting to a voice of customer uh, intake conversation, a demand conversation. There's a requirements documentation step. There's a bill step, so on and so on. Then from that point of view, what comes out of this overall? And then who receives it? That's my customer. Now, the goal is, can we just put this on a big flip chart or whiteboard right now? and say which step on this requirements process has the most pain. And so we might say, well, you know, they're, they're all opportunities for improvement. But step two is really, really where we're having the throughput issues, the capacity issues, the defect issues, the, you know, the, the pain, if you will. 
So we then dive into step two, which then we can actually create another side plot. For step two, what's the supplier, the input, the process activities within step two? And so what this does is that within a short period of time, it takes all of the group involved in the value stream, which is, by the way, many people, not just consultants, the people that are involved in the activities, the people that are overseeing the activities, the people that are receiving the, uh, the outcome of these activities, the people supplying in, you cannot do a SIPOC and value stream analysis without all stakeholders involved, or well, at least you can't do it effectively. And so we get down to agreement, okay, we're going we're gonna to set boundaries around our improvement activity through this SIPOC analysis. So we all agree there are many opportunities, but step two, and then within step two, there's one thing. We're going to fix that one thing, and we're going to make it happen, and we're going to do this again. But let's move now from SIPOC, which is a which is for setting boundaries and scoping down to the next step. We're going to have this process flow already mapped out. We need to know how fast does this overall value stream and or process have to actually work to keep up with incoming demand. This is the concept of tack time, the cadence the process must work at to supply value in the context of, you know, how fast must it work so that I don't have inventory piling up because tack time is very important. Because if the tack time is too slow for the value stream, the customer is getting angry because their, their pony's not arriving on time. Okay, that back to our earlier conversation. Uh, we, have demand, we, have, we have more demand coming in than the system of value generation can handle. And so inventory piles up. Now, if the tack time is too fast, now we're, over, we're overproducing, or we've got people in the system, in the value stream, literally twiddling their thumbs. So understanding the tack time cadence is a, is a calculation. I know the time available to work. I know the incoming demand. And so I can calculate the cadence of the tack time at which either the end-to-end -end value stream must operate or even one activity. I can talk about tack time relative to one task because it's all going to come back down to this time premise. So let's look at a value stream template. So here's a, a generic value stream. Okay, so you've got the overall process. The, the box on top is the name of the process, whether it's requirements generation, change management, request fulfillment, employee onboarding, name your value stream. The white box in that blue box, let's say that's our estimated time. When we're designing this process, we estimate it to, to be or should take this. Now, that's not good enough because what looks good on paper may not be actually true in reality. So below the blue box down here, we're going to see process time. Process time is an analysis of the actual time, not the <laughs> estimated time. And important is the wait time between steps. And remember, we talk about time in many different concepts. There's the process time, which is the time it actually takes to do work. There's the wait time, which is I've got my task done, but now it's waiting in the queue for the next person to take it into their step. Lean talks about different types of time. Cycle time is the total time that the activity works from the point of start, step one, to its completed, step three. And so that can be my total cycle time. This is my predicted, uh, in the estimated concept, aspect of evaluation of what it should take. But then there's actuals, which is the process time. So the total cycle time is the point of start to the point of completion. Now, a little bit different than some of the, the service management terms here, lead time is the point of order, which starts on the front end of step one to the point the customer receives value. So we're going to need to look at different time elements in our value stream. We're going to want to estimate. We're going to want to calculate or measure actual process time. We're going to want to know what the wait time between each process is. We're going to want to understand also some other times we've already talked about because each task might have a setup time, time you know, to basically set up for this compile activity, time to set up for the knowledge uh, retrieval, and then there's even filing time or, or switching costs where I'm literally storing things away so that I can move on to the next time. So I can actually get even more refined in my time analysis. But the premise is we want to begin understanding the estimate versus the actual because we're going to look for opportunities to shave time out of this conversation to improve throughput and value creation. 
Now we're going to do that by looking at a number of different waste concepts we've already talked about, where we have too much waiting time. People are moving from task to task too much. We have rework happening where that form gets, 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 keeps getting kicked back. Uh, we're over-processing. We're making too many of these things. Right? We have various stakeholders involved. We're going to be in now analyzing this value stream and using these symbols, which are standard value stream symbols, to look at our total value stream now in a couple of different ways. So think about it this way. Here's an example that's been filled out. So I've got this change process, and the estimated time up here is 260 minutes <laughs> or hours. Now, that's the point you'll have to also define. You know, it's, this is really about coming up with a standard time um, denominator. In this case, it's probably hours. So each activity, I have an estimate, right? I have an actual. Sometimes the estimate, the 10, not too far off the actual. Sometimes the estimate, in the case of plan order, not even close. Or deliver order, not even close. So the reality is that my process time in the calculation bottom right corner is 352, which is nowhere near the 260 estimate, which is above. Now, another way to look at value stream is I can now look at lead time. Remember, lead time will include all the wait time as well. So that's the point of start to end. And now what I can do is I can take my actual process time, my 352 hours and or minutes, doesn't matter, this is just an example, and divide that into my total lead time, which is when the customer actually receives the value, and I can calculate this in the context of efficiency. Now, what I can do is I can shave different times here. I can shave process time. I can shave wait times. I can shave setup times. I can, sa I can shave switching time. And by that, you can obviously see the process time would improve, which would increase my calculation of efficiency for this process. Now, this is a way to quantifiably show to senior leaders what a tangible improvement has been made because in IT, we talk about time as money, and it is because that's the highest resource we use. If I can shave literally 12 hours out of my total value stream by doing a time analysis, I'm looking at my activities and I'm removing all the eliminating the, the waste, I'm minimizing the necessary non-value and, and focusing on optimizing the value, and let's say I bump that up from 6.6 .6 to 8.5, I don't know. And I think, well, that's an actual 25 hours of savings. I take the average salary of the person working in the value stream, use that as a calculation. I can very easily quantify in very hard terms the value presented in this process improvement. And I'm not done. I'm going to go back and do this again because lean is all about never stopping. Challenge everything. Always ask why. I have to look for these points of rework, and I have to look at my problem analysis data to say where a defect is happening. I have to look for things where I have way too much wait time in activities. You see, here's the premise. If you're only doing you know, your process design based on what the book says or what the customer wants, and you stop at process modeling, the typical you know, swim lane diagram, and never move on to value stream analysis, you are probably over-engineering your process, and you're not dealing with throughput, and you're not dealing with cost, and you're not dealing with delivery. Chances are, if you're not doing a value stream analysis on any process that you're currently working with, you have an over-engineered process. When you take a best practice book of any sort, in any brand, and you say, this is the way we're going to do it because you know best practice says so, that's a good piece of information because someone's thought through what is a good practice? However, if you don't take that good book and put a lean lens in front of it, you are probably not doing a good service to the organization you're working with. You see, until I became aware of lean, I didn't even know that I hadn't been completing the final design element. 
we are probably being, no, not probable, we are being irresponsible in process improvement and process design without taking our process design to a final value stream analysis for flow, for defect, and for value creation and improvement. And I passionately believe this. I'm hoping you're seeing the same. I want you to go back and think about the fact that you know, the average person probably has at most 20, 25% of their week activity spent in planned work, work that the customer would willingly pay for. Now, I want you to reverse engineer that conversation to what I said earlier. What's the definition of waste? Something the customer wouldn't willingly pay for. You're probably already making this connection, but that means the unplanned work is waste. 70, 75% of the activity we do is waste. I think there's an opportunity for some lean improvement here. So I'm trusting that you saw some value in this conversation um, and that you see what I've come to see. And I was introduced to this by a book called Lean IT. And I got uh, involved in this lean, lean community several years ago and I then became a uh, contributing author to another book that was called Run, Grow, Transform by Steve Bell and Mike Orson. I highly recommend both of these books. Uh, these are the first books that I've read that really deal with service management and lean in the IT and IT management best practice context, whether we're talking the project space or the development or the, uh, the operations or service management, all of the above is true because we're all part of the same value streams. For more information, again, I mentioned this recording will be, well, this session will be recorded. I have a blog, and I've been doing work in Lean for some time now, and I have a podcast called Practitioner Radio that I do with George Balding. And there are several podcasts here on my blog that you can find. You can just do a search on these various elements. Uh, using Lean Visual Management was a recent one, just recently released, and that's another conversation for another day. Gaining senior leadership buy-in. It's this kind of conversation we're having right now. How to use theory of constraints, lean and six sigma as practical CSI methods. If you're interested, we teach lean and because we believe soundly in the premise that this is something that all organizations need to do. In fact, recently we have uh, put another lean course on our schedule. Uh, we do instructor led online courses you can take from your desk. And on May 27 and May 28, uh, we've just put one out on public availability. So if you want to actually learn more about Lean and gain certification in Lean IT, take a look at the uh, ILO, the instructor-led online session we're doing. So I'm, I'm going to pause to see if there's any questions at this point. I haven't seen anything come in. <laughs> actually, there's a chat. Let me take a look at that. Thank you very much, Doug. I appreciate the compliment. Any questions before we uh, close down today? You can pop that into either the chat to me or the Q&A. Looks like uh, I've satisfied the curiosity for this morning. I want to thank you for your attendance this morning. Uh, for more information or for checking out my blog uh, or following me on Twitter, this is a, a very important subject. And I, I believe and I trust after the session, one that all of us must understand and cannot ignore. Without lean, we are probably doing a disservice to our organization. Thank you very much and have a great morning.